Hi, good afternoon, um, and welcome to the first session of BCHN's Learning Cafe at BCHN. The topic for today's session is Addressing Basic Social Needs in the Time of COVID and Beyond, Voices Leading the Way. The Bronx Community Health Network, or BCHN, is a federally qualified health center and a community-based organization. BCHN contracts for comprehensive and quality primary care and related services at 21 community and school-based health centers. We are committed to eliminating health disparities among the underserved communities in the Bronx. BCHN has a comprehensive health and wellness program, which assists roughly 47,000 Bronx residents in 2019. Our programs include health education, care coordination, public benefits enrollment, chronic disease management, and referrals and linkages to primary care and community services. Integrated into all our programs is a process of identifying community members who have social determinants of health needs and connecting them to healthcare and social services. Our programs are staffed by community health workers, patient navigators, and health educators who are community residents with shared lived experiences. I am Tashi Chodun, Director of Programs at BCHN. I, and I am pleased to inform you that today's discussion is the first in a series of many learning cafe sessions that BCHN will be hosting for both community and healthcare and social service providers. Now, I would like to give you some background on this important issue of social needs and health to help set up the core of today's discussion. We knew before the COVID-19 pandemic that there is a high prevalence of social needs in disadvantaged communities, such as the Bronx which is the least healthy county among the 62 counties in New York state. We also knew that these social needs are the major drivers of our health and if not addressed, can widen existing health disparities. So in other words, this is not new to us. The COVID-19 pandemic shed more light on this critical issue of social needs and health. Although COVID-19 does not discriminate in whom it infects and sickens, we find that certain racial or ethnic minority groups and the disadvantaged and underserved populations are disproportionately impacted because of social determinants of health. Socioeconomic factors play a key role in COVID-19 infection and mortality rates. By November of 2020, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention had reported that black people were 1.4 times more likely to contract the COVID-19 virus and 2.8 times more likely to die from it than their white counterparts. Socioeconomic factors, including densely populated housing, limited healthcare access, and higher poverty rates have contributed to a greater risk of infection. Another study published in the Journal of Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities demonstrated that adverse social determinants of health are the strongest predictor of high COVID-19 mortality rates on the county level. The study showed that counties with higher COVID-19 death rates had a higher proportion of black residents and greater levels of adverse social determinants of health. New York City's data revealed that eight of the 10 zip codes with the most deaths from COVID-19 are home to low income populations that are predominantly black, Hispanic, and Asian. Social needs in, the un in underserved and disadvantaged communities also contribute to the higher incidence of chronic diseases like asthma, cardiova uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and obesity in such communities. Now, these are the same chronic conditions that put individuals at higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19. The prevalence of social determinants of health needs in disadvantaged communities like the Bronx rapidly spiked during the pandemic. The unemployment rate in the Bronx increased drastically from 4.9% in January of 2020 to 17.7% in January of 2021, which by the way was the highest rate among all 62 counties in New York state. Many social needs are interdependent and impact one's health. Loss of income may lead to food insecurity, eviction and homelessness, and loss of health insurance. Individuals without health insurance are less likely to utilize or even have access to primary care, which widens health disparities. The COVID-19 pandemic clearly demonstrates this interconnectedness among social needs. So my key message here is that in order to reduce health disparities, 
and to better manage future health emergencies, we must invest more efforts and more resources to address the root of the problem, that is social determinants of health. We are fortunate today to have an incredible group of panelists who represent some of the key leaders in the Bronx. We can't wait to hear their voices leading the way during the pandemic. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Simbo Ige. Dr. Ige serves as Assistant Commissioner in the Bureau of Health Equity Capacity Building at the Center of Health Equity and Community Wellness of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So Dr. Ige, please take it away. Um, hello everyone and thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, so I am gonna share my, um, my slide quickly. Um, so I am Simbo and um, my primary role right now is building capacity for health equity. And when people say health equity, uh, some of the numbers that you have shared Tashi, they just resonate. Uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do in the city from the government, but the scale of the pandemic is such that there is not one organization or agency that can do this alone. So I am grateful for this platform and for the opportunity to join you in this conversation. I like to start by giving you a little background into what we're dealing with here. Um, so the, the pandemic has impacted um, over 633,000 people in the city of New York alone. So these are the number of cases that we've had. 14% hospitalization and over 31,000 deaths um, from uh, last year, January 2020 uh, to date. So this is not something that um, to be trivialized, it is something that has impacted every single household, every single family uh, in this city. And the impact of COVID-19 is not just in hospitalization and death. It also is evident in many other aspects of our everyday life. Uh, one, uh, Tashi has already established that the impact of COVID-19 is unevenly distributed there are certain populations that have been impacted more than others. So COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on Black Hispanic populations uh, more than any other population. Um, when we look at how COVID has impacted education and, and childcare, 89% of the city residents who stopped working um, because of COVID uh, are people who had to care for children, mostly women. Um, when we think about livability, Food insecurity has skyrocketed uh, because of COVID. Um, and this again is felt mostly among communities of color. 27% uh, of those who reported food insecurity uh, are men and women, 29% uh, food insecure. And these are men and women uh, of color, particularly those who identify as black. Evictions and homelessness. Between June 20 uh, and November 29, 2020, 28,490 private evictions were filed compared to 68,000 for three years uh, before that. So again, the impact of COVID is beyond hospitalization. It is even those who are not hospitalized and, and, and in the hospital are also suffering from the ripple effects of this pandemic. Small business impact, 22% of small businesses in the city have been shut down. Um, transportation ridership has reduced dramatically. 70% uh, and 50% at the height of, of the pandemic. Uh, loss of revenue, the city has been impacted. Staffing has been impacted. So we are the Department of Health for instance, you know, we have been on constant activation for almost a year with the hiring freeze. Uh, so the city is constrained by current financial crisis, limited staffing and recurring response activities. So the same people who are doing regular job are doing four, three, four different jobs responding to the pandemic. So 
uh, these, these are all highlights of how this pandemic has impacted different services, including those who have the responsibility of providing these services. And so we have begun conversations, interagency conversations around what is the path to recovery? How do we start getting our city back? Uh, and there are a number of agencies that are involved and I've just put here brief descriptions with all of the different agencies that are working on the different aspects of the recovery. Uh, from elevating community perspective and connections, uh, that's by the City Hall uh, Community Advice uh, Affairs Unit, uh, to how do we keep families together in their homes and improving housing access uh, that is being led uh, by the Department of Housing and uh, healthcare services, supporting providers, strengthening service delivery, making sure there's access to services uh, that is being championed by Department of Health and connecting people to jobs and strengthening communities uh, by the Department of, of, uh, of uh, Transportation, et cetera. So, so many agencies have to be part of this uh, recovery and all of this work is being coordinated by NISAM. Uh, but all of this work, uh, you have highlighted the role that social determinants of health play in this, we know that the conditions that determine whether we are healthy or not are determined outside of the healthcare institutions. They are related to the food that we eat. They are related to the jobs that we have. They are related to the quality of the air that we breathe in and the environment that we live in. Uh, they are related to the neighborhood conditions, availability of food, availability of housing, the quality of, of healthcare and affordability of healthcare. These are what we call the social determinants of health. And we cannot advance health equity by just looking at healthcare. We have to advance health equity by looking at equity in all of these different dimensions of the social determinants of health. And that's what we are doing at the Department of Health, even though our primary responsibility is health, but we understand that the determinants of health go outside of hospitals and healthcare institutions and partnerships are important in all of these different dimensions. So partnerships for, he um, for health equity through social determinants of health. So we've invested a lot in the partnerships. How do we address the social and community context uh, that New Yorkers live in? So we are working on social cohesion uh, and that is knowing that you can call someone. So their partnership with community health workers with peer organizations, with community outreach and engagement teams, community-based organizations that are providing these services. Uh, increase in access to food, uh, expanding the Get Food Authorized Enrollers. Uh, there has been a, a, um, a recent request for application to expand that opportunity to more neighborhoods. Um, education and literacy, vaccine literacy, health literacy. Uh, we, are, we have um, a coalition of test and trace CBOs uh, that have been working with us now for a year uh, in building health literacy around COVID prevention. And now they're gonna be expanded to support the work on vaccine literacy. Uh, so we have housing ambassadors uh, from our staff and our community partners that are also helping to connect uh, community residents to housing resources. So it's not sufficient for you to go into a community and say, you know, I wanna to talk to you about testing and tracing. I like, I'm hungry. I like, no, I'm not interested in if you're hungry. I just wanna to talk to you about testing and tracing. It doesn't work, you know? So we have to do wraparound services. So we, our approach is we're not just leading with testing and tracing messaging is that we are also ensuring that this partnership also link people to all of these other services. Access to healthcare, mental health support has been key in this pandemic. So many people are stressed. So many people have, you know, new or a deepening mental health uh, 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 issues that they need support with, connection to care on me mental health and behavioral health needs. Uh, so NYC Well is a service that we have been sharing uh, with uh, New Yorkers. Uh, so this is 24 hours counseling support to all New Yorkers. Uh, and you can text or call or, or, uh, um, or go online to get connected to these services. Uh, we're also partnering with community health centers and, and um, FQHCs. 
and also providing employment assistance uh, in the communities. I wanna highlight one way that we are also taking a deeper dive in the communities that uh, have been most impacted by this pandemic. So we have used a hyper-local place-based approach, and now we are working through our neighborhood health action centers uh, in East Harlem, in the Bronx, in Tremont, uh, and, and in Brownsville. And now we have extended that support to Queens working with Corona and Elmos through our neighborhood response teams. Uh, so these are opportunities for us to be closer to those communities that need additional resources and that have been most impacted by the pandemic. So some of the core principles of how we are ensuring that residents get access to the services and resources that they need uh, throughout this pandemic is leveraging power and privilege. Uh, working across all of the different institutions where decisions are made, where policies are made to highlight, uh, elevate community voices, uh, to change upstream systems and policies and not just, you know, uh, putting a band-aid on the problems. Another approach that we're using is amplifying community power, mobilizing, being part of the converse conversations. Uh, so this kind of spaces that you have created uh, for Department of Health to be part of the conversation, how do we amplify the community power, the community voices? Uh, so we have community advisory groups uh, made up of represent representatives from 80 different sectors across the city that have been um, guiding or providing recommendations on the test and trace response and also on the vaccine component of our work right now. Uh, so there are a few things that we still need to do and there is still a call to action for our partners. And you, I, I, I want to ensure that I reiterate the messaging that COVID is still here uh, we're not out of the woods yet. We cannot take our eyes off the goal yet. And so I want to remind us that getting tested and staying away from others, six feet away from others when you're outside of the house is still important. Uh, the core for prevention strategies is still important. Uh, we know that um, uh, there are many people who are not yet vaccinated. So we want to reinforce that this messaging is still important. Uh, we have an updated face covering guidance uh, because now we have an emergence of variants that are more easily transmissible. So we want folks to know that they can reinforce their protection by wearing two face masks uh, when they're outside of the house uh, or wear a KN95 mask that provides uh, a better protection. Um, the vaccine is here. We're very excited about it. It's a game changer in the pandemic. Uh, it's safe, it's free, it's easy. Uh, the numbers are encouraging. Across the United States, we have vaccinated uh, over 143,000 people have received this vaccine. And in New York, we are now close to 4 million people that have received the vaccine. So we're making progress there, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, we don't know what herd immunity is going to be, but for us to get 70% of adults, that means we need to vaccinate 88% of New Yorkers need to get those shots in their arms for us to be out of the woods. Uh, so working to expand access to this vaccine is a core part of our health equity strategy and providing transportation, language access and other support to our communities to be able to access the vaccination is also part of what we can do. So we, I leave you with this additional uh, call to action for the vaccine please get the vaccine when you become eligible. Uh, please get, keep getting tested and practicing the call for prevention strategies until we have um, more New Yorkers vaccinated. There is information available. Please share accurate information with your networks and share on social media when and if you get vaccinated. It is encouraging to folks. Uh, and this is a resource guide, and I'll put the detailed uh, uh, PDF in the chat. Uh, testing locations. Where can I find the hotel program? If I am not able to quarantine at home, the city provides support for hoteling uh, for those who are not able to quarantine at home. Uh, if you have any questions about COVID-related needs and other health needs, 
you can call 11 on the number of the screen, mental health services, NYC Well, unemployment assistance, food assistance. Uh, these are additional information that you can share with your network. Um, I leave you with this quote, uh, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. So thank you for the partnership and thank you for the opportunity to be part of the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Yege, for this wonderful uh, informative presentation and for walking us through all this very important um, uh, initiatives um, and programs that are happening within the city. Um, and um, and um, again, thank you very much. Now I'll introduce you to Renee Whiskey. Renee is our community health and programs developer and will be moderating today's session. So take it away, Renee. Hey, good evening, everyone. And thank you again for joining us today. We're going to move into the panelist portion of the session this afternoon. So just to give you a sense of what's to follow, I'm going to introduce you to our esteemed guest panelists. And as we move through their introductions, they will also have the opportunity to briefly share with us the work of their respective organizations. Then we'll move into the panel where each speaker will be invited to answer a few questions that we've prepared to get a good sense and understanding of how COVID-19 impacted the social needs landscape. Then we'll answer a few questions from our audience. So if you have any questions during the panel, please enter them into the Q&A box. And if they're for a specific panelist, please indicate that uh, in your, along with your question. Lastly, after questions, we'll move into closing remarks. With that said, I'm very excited to introduce our panelists. First up, we have uh, Mr. Josef Aguilar, who serves as the Associate Director of Next Step Services for Part of the Solution, also known as POTS. Josef joined POTS in 2015 as its Nutrition Outreach and Education Program Coordinator and was promoted to Program, Man Program Manager in 2017 and Associate Director of Next Step Services in 2019. He currently oversees POTS workforce development, case management, and comprehensive case management teams, which annually secures nearly $12 million in benefits each year. While, while at POTS, he has created partnerships that deepen clients' access to healthcare-related benefits, workforce programs, mental health services, and many other services. Thank you for joining us, Josef. Please tell us a little bit about POTS. Hi. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for having me. I've been I've known um, Bronx Community Health Network when I first started as a navigator, uh, and I've done a couple of presentations there. So it's really nice to get invited to this dis important discussion. So as you said, POTS mission um, here in the Bronx is to be a loving community that nourishes the basic needs and hungers of all that come through its door. We have been helping low income families and individuals since 1982. POTS actually started as a soup kitchen and has grown to become a leading provider of emergency food and social services. We have a one-stop shop model of integrated programs that offers a range of supportive services to carry out our mission and vision of helping low-income individuals and families move from crisis to stability and ultimately self-sufficiency. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. next we have up Ms. Patricia Bernard. Patricia serves as Community Health Worker Supervisor at Bronx Community Health Network or BCHN. She oversees a group of 20 community health workers who are either integrated into clinical or community settings to help Bronx residents navigate both medical and social service systems. Their work aims to improve Bronx sites health holistically. Patricia is a public health professional with over 10 years of local and international experience she has led numerous community health initiatives aiming at increasing access to quality health care, decreasing maternal mortality and morbidity, and addressing social determinants of health in efforts to narrow the persisting health disparities. Thank you for joining us, Patricia. Please tell us a little bit about PCHN. Thank you, Renee. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Renee. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I do, I'm just going to touch on some of the things that Tashi said. I know Tashi introduced uh, BCHN when we first started. Um, so BCHN, as Net, Tashi mentioned, is a, a, a FQHC and a community-based organization. Uh, we've been in the Bronx for over 20 years. 
And to really keep it very simple, our mission is really to improve the health of all bronchitis holistically and to decrease um, health disparities. And we try to really do that in focusing on three things, <clears throat> I would say, I'm sorry. Um, the first one is to increase access to quality healthcare services. Uh, we also focus on connecting uh, patients to resources, so identifying social determinants of health and connecting patients or community health work, community work, community members, I'm sorry, to resources in the community. And last but not least, uh, we also do a lot of health education in the community. We partner with faith-based organizations or other community-based organizations to ensure that we're constantly um, facilitating workshops that either deal with hypertension, diabetes, or any other uh, health-related topic to improve uh, the literacy among uh, Bronx residents. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Ms. Catherine Clark, who serves as the Deputy Director for Development and Administration at the University Neighborhood Housing Program, also called UNHP. She has worked as a merchant organizer, a loan packager, community-based planner, and program developer. She's a proud team member of UNHP for the past 25 years and supports the organization as part of their neighborhood resource and direct service team as a grant writer and communication specialist. Thank you for joining us, Catherine. Please tell us a little bit about UNHP. Thank you, and it's great to be here. Um, Great to be with our partners at Bronx Community Health, um, our partners with, with POTS, um, and we love to partner. I think it speaks um, a lot about uh, who we are as an organization. Um, we are a community-based organization. We grew out of a people power movement in the mid-70s um, when there was widespread private and public abandonment of the Bronx. Our mission is to create and preserve affordable housing and to bring resources to our Northwest Bronx community. We do that in three different ways. First, we're a community-based affordable housing developer. Uh, we oversee 27 multifamily um, affordable housing uh, buildings um, that are home to over 1,200 um, low-income families and individuals. Um, in that way, we also work with other nonprofit um, affordable housing managers and owners um, to collectively try to make sure that this type of housing remains affordable. We're also a Bronx focused researcher. Um, through that piece, we, um, we created something called the Building Indicator Project and we work collaboratively with both banks and community groups to address distressed multifamily buildings in New York City. We also, under our research arm, really try to highlight and give voice to some of the, the problems that um, are, you know, are part of kind of the Bronx as a unique borough. And finally, we're a direct service provider. Um, we created um, something we call the Northwest Bronx Resource Center. We work collaboratively with six other um, nonprofits to bring resources to our community. And we help about 3,000 people each year uh, with our affordable housing and uh, free financial services. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, next up and last, but not cer certainly not least, uh, Ms. Judy Seacon. Judy Seacon serves as the, as the New York Common Pantry Senior Director of Programs and Operations. Judy has 30 years of experience in the nonprofit field. She was the vice president at Phoenix House Foundation, a leading nonprofit drug rehabilitation center, and most recently, the executive director at Rye Youth Council for 15 years. As senior director of programs and operations, she manages the programs and services of NYCP, ensures quality in ongoing operations and develops strategic program initiatives. Thank you for joining us, Judy. Please tell us a little bit about New York Common Pantry. Thank you for having me. New York Common Pantry is a food pantry social service organization. We've been around since the 1980s, um, providing food and social services, nutrition education, and senior feeding programs. Uh, since the pandemic, we have given out over 6.5 million meals throughout the Bronx and all the other boroughs as well. Um, we have a 
two brick and mortar pantries. One is in East Harlem and the other is in the Longwood section of the Bronx, which was established in 2017. We also operate a nutrition education program out of the Mott Haven section of the Bronx and a senior feeding program whose headquarters is in also in Mott Haven, but goes to over a hundred sites throughout um, every borough of New York City, over 30 of those sites are in the Bronx. The senior feeding program feeds over 15,000 seniors each month. Um, so it is an extensive growing program. And um, as well as like POTS, we also operate because um, we recognize that it's not just about giving the food. It's also about stabilizing people's lives. So in conjunction with the food, the social services program, the case management, the benefits assessment that we provide goes hand in hand with the food because our goal really is to put ourselves out of business and um, stabilize people's lives and help not just with the food. We've recognized how important the food is. Um, we've always known how important the food is. I think everybody else has recognized how important the food is since COVID. Um, it was an invisible problem that became a visible problem, but it's always been a problem that we've been dealing with um, that and all the social supports that are necessary to help to, to get beyond the food piece of it. Thank you so much. Okay, so those were wonderful introductions. I think there's a lot of great work happening here and I'm happy to move right on into the questions. So uh, we'll start with the first one. Uh, COVID-19 has certainly really shifted the dynamics of health and social support work as you've all just mentioned. Um, how have priorities changed from pre-COVID to now? In your responses, tell us a little bit about the top needs that might have changed and how you might've addressed them. Uh, we'll start with Jose. Hi, thank you. Yeah, no, so um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a massive, a massive demand in our, on our pantry services. In 2019, we served 1.1 million meals and that more than doubled in 2020. Mm -hmm. We saw uh, people from, come to POTS from every part of New York City. Many of our neighbors here in the community had never heard about POTS and they were, um, they found out about our pantry because you know, there was a, a line around the corner uh, every day, even we had people even driving by and looking and driving by again and uh, and getting in the line to receive food. We served, as I said, 2.2 million meals and the demand continues to be high in 2021. We also saw, um, we all saw that, you know, the rates of unemployment were extremely high when one in four residents are out of a job. And um, we also saw um, housing, housing resources continues to increase. Everybody needs an affordable place to live. And that has been a challenge for a long time in the Bronx. Um, POTS really never closed. And, and we try to quickly adapt to re uh, working remotely to continue to provide assistance to clients. Um, we help clients apply for SNAP and other, other benefits, as well as to find COVID-related resources like food pantry delivery services for seniors. Um, some of the highlights in, in 2020, you know, POTS served um, close to 41,000 families. Um, through our NEXIP services programs, we help clients get access to more than uh, around $7 million in public benefits and uh, $700,000 in private benefits. Um, our legal team prevented 180 evictions. Um, we also collaborated, collaborated with the census to educate the community. Uh, on the importance of being counted. Um, this is just once every 10 years, a lot of people didn't know, uh, especially our immigrant families are like, what is the census? So we were able to really uh, try to make an impact there. We also were able to distribute thousands of masks and hand sanitizer cleaning supplies at the beginning of the pandemic. We, we still continue to get donations and distribute those resources that are really needed for the community. Um, we're also, you know, normally pots, um, has different uh, holiday distributions. So during during uh, the holidays, we've been able to distribute turkeys. We distribute more turkeys this year than any other year, and other essential items and uh, any other other items that we get as donations. Um, how POTS is currently um, working? We are we're continuing to offer services in a modified format. Uh, following CDC guidelines. Um, I can talk a little bit about the program. So these programs include uh, our emergency food program, 
with uh, fresh to go lunches from the community dining room and prepackaged groceries from the food pantry. Um, our day to day services, including mail, uh, the homeless population needs a place to get mail. Um, and to, if they apply for SNAP, they need a place to get you know, their benefit card and access, access those benefits. Um, so we provide that. We also restarted the shower program and the haircut program for our homeless population. Um, we continue to you know, screen clients for eligibility and access to income supports. Um, our legal team continues to be focused on eviction prevention. Right now there's a moratorium, but we know that we're gonna have a huge wave uh, of evictions uh, coming pretty soon. So we're trying to um, find resources and put strategies together to, to address that when it comes. Um, our workforce program is helping clients get access to training while a lot of, a lot of the families are at home. We're encouraging them to take the opportunity to find online trainings, get certified, start working on your resume, start working on your cover letter. So when those jobs start coming back, uh, we're able to, you are able to hit the round run, uh, running. Um, our comprehensive case management, uh, which helps families, individuals and families reach short and long-term goals, uh, have been doing all that work remotely um, and by video calls and, and email. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Seekon, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, so we, we, we operate similarly. Once the pandemic hit, we had to move all of our operations outside um, so that, you know, um, and be socially distanced. So the lines were quite long and extended quite far. Um, we also, um, run a soup kitchen hot meals program, which also served outside. We also do the showers. Um, we've not yet figured out how to bring back haircuts. So I'd like to talk to you about that. Um, but that was one of our services. Um, but for us, the real story of the pandemic um, and what we were able to provide was a mobile delivery program. We had always had as an intention um, as a strategic goal to do a mobile delivery program and we were heading there, but the pandemic made it really clear to us that it wasn't just homebound people, but it was people who couldn't travel on the subway or couldn't take public transportation to get to our existing sites um, and that they were in need of food and they were desperately in need of food. And we partnered with a number of different uh, social service organizations that were not giving out food previously, but they also quickly recognized that what their participants really needed at this time was food. Um, and they didn't, you know, they, they called us and they were basically like, we don't know how to put together a bag of food. We don't know what makes a well-rounded bag of food, we don't, but you do. And we have people in need and can we partner together? And we did that um, the week of April 6th last year was our first mobile delivery. And we now work with over 30 organizations um, to get food out every day. We, we repurposed, we were running a fairly vibrant food rescue program that would pick up food from cafeterias and institutions and do school drives. That stopped when the pandemic, pandemic hit because they all closed. And we repurposed our vehicles and our drivers to be able to do mobile. So we now, in the past week, um, Sent out thirty thousand meals through our mobile program, and they're not—they're not meals like a um, a hot meal. They are actually pantry bags of food. So there's grains, there's produce, there's fresh produce, um, and canned produce, and uh, shelf-stable milk and protein. So tuna, beans, um, chicken. So that is—that's really what we were able our what was new for us during the pandemic was it really accelerated our mobile program and what we were able to do. We serve all the boroughs are by far our largest has been in the Bronx over 55% of what we've been doing is, is in the Bronx. And we recognize, um, you know, that $5 it takes to take a subway, even if somebody can take the subway, which they couldn't during the pandemic could go to food. So it's really important that we go out to where people are and that's what we've been doing and that's what we intend to continue to do. And we will um, package that with our nutrition education um, and with our case management services. So we will be bringing the full range of our services to, to these mobile programs and um, it will be a big piece of what we're doing in the future. 
And, you know, it, it sprung out of the need for COVID and the immediate need for food, but is, is an effective response to um, the food insecurity in the city. Well, wow, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Bernard, would you like to respond? Yeah. You're on mute. Sorry. Sure, thank you. Um, I think I want to kind of touch a little bit on what several people have said uh, so far. I think, again, for us, at BCHN, you know, our mission is to improve uh, the health of Bronxites. That didn't change during the pandemic. Uh, we had been very heavily involved pre-pandemic in social determinants of health work. For the past four years, uh, patients and community members who screen positive for either housing insecurity, food insecurity, transportation insecurity, and a host of other problems were referred to our team of community health workers, and they work day in and day out to connect them to resources in the community to address that need. So that obviously continued throughout the pandemic. Um, what we did notice for us when we looked at our numbers uh, the type of need didn't necessarily change. Uh, Pre-COVID, housing insecurity and food insecurity were always the top needs, and that remained throughout the pandemic. We had a lot more people calling and saying, hey, we don't have food. Hey, we've lost uh, the breadwinner of this family, and we, we, we can't afford to buy food anymore. Or we've lost our employment, and we can't necessarily uh, afford to pay rent. We definitely saw an exponential increase in those numbers. And, and I think in our response, uh, we, we did kind of like a little bit of everything. Uh, we, did, uh, work, um, we did work remote, but I think one of the first things that we did is because of the stay at home orders, uh, because people were unable or afraid to go out and because everybody was kind of transitioning to their a new way of providing services or some organizations that historically had been providing services were now temporarily not providing services anymore. Our team of community health workers were really good at keeping track of that. Who is still open? Who is not open? Who's providing what service at what time? What is the city making available now? What is the state making available now? And sharing all that information with every and any community health uh, community member that reached out to us. Uh, we did um, wellness checks. So we were able to call some of the patients, patients that we had previously worked with before and said, hey, we're calling you, we're calling to check on you. How are you doing? But most importantly, do you need anything? And connect people uh, to the right places or to the places that we're uh, providing uh, services. I think Partnership has also been key for us. Uh, Dr. Egan mentioned some of the city initiatives that we've part of, and we were able to enroll people in the Get Food NYC program. So one of our staff members, or a few of our staff members actually are enrollers. And so when we came across a family that was food insecure, not only were we able to say like, hey, we're gonna send you to the food pantry, but we're also gonna help you apply for SNAP. We may refer you to, we may refer you to POTS because we work in collaboration with them. Or you know what, um, there's actually the city program and we'll enroll you in that as well if you're interested. Similarly to um, the comment pantry, we've had, we had a, a van that we were, re outreach van that we were super excited um, to start using. Then the pandemic hit, it was kind of sitting in the garage for some time. And then our CHWs were like, people are afraid to go out. People who have underlying conditions cannot go out. P seniors cannot go out and they are food insecure. So we partnered with uh, the Montefiore uh, Bravo Food Pantry. And ever since we've been able to deliver food um, to food insecure families who are unable to go out. Um, we've been doing that to date since last year. We've, and we've served over a thousand families. And that's a program that we also uh, want to continue to grow. We've worked uh, on providing one-on-one -on -one assistance to, um, to people who are interested in the housing connect applications and the housing lottery. So there's been a lot of work around that. And there's also been just a lot of work in general around um, just navigating the way, the new way that services uh, were being offered. And, and I think the last thing that I'll also say, um, and I think it's kind of to piggyback on what Judy said, she mentioned, you know, sometimes saving $5 just makes a big difference. Uh, we work with uh, prenatal moms or new families, and we were able to partner with an organization called Her Village, uh, which allowed us to provide families, needy families, with diapers, right? And so because we're able to do that for families, we knew that the money that they were saving because they, not, they didn't have to buy diapers, was they were able to spend that on other um, essential expenses um, for the family. 
Great, thank you for sharing. And Ms. Clark. Yes. Um, you know, um, what uh, Tashi had said in the beginning about, you know, the issues that were brought to the forefront at COVID were not new to us, us being Bronx Community Health Network. Um, they weren't new to us either at University Neighborhood Housing Program, and I'm sure, you know, other people who, who work in the Bronx. So, um, you know, how have we changed? I mean, in many ways, you know, we're still working on the same issues. You know, the need for affordable housing, I mean, you know, the connection with the affordable housing crisis and the need for more than one family to live in one apartment or for people to rent rooms, you know, that was intertwined with the health issues, you know, with COVID where you have, you know, too many people, you know, in the same place, um, you know, people who work um, in, you know, the face-to-face -face and service industries, you know, bringing the virus home. So we, we continue to work on the same issues. So that didn't change. I will say, you know, our work did feel much more important than ever. I mean, it really felt, you know, that, um, you know, we needed to respond in every way that we could. Um, we were in the middle of our tax program, which is a big face-to-face -face program when COVID hit. So we had to shut that down. We went all remote. So we, we continued to help people process their returns that we had been working with. And um, because we had a, a remote Wi-Fi phone system, we were able to keep taking calls from people. And that really became the lifeline for, you know, the 3,000, you know, families that we serve. So we got calls um, about the stimulus, calls about finishing the taxes, and then new to us, really calls about food. Um, so UNHP definitely contributed to those lines around the corner at POTS. Um, we had partnered previously, but people who before had said they, you know, they, they didn't need a food pantry, needed it now. And we do work with a lot of seniors um, and, you know, and unbeknownst to us, many people with underlying health conditions. So they could not, they couldn't, they couldn't get to the food pantry and they couldn't shop. So connecting them with um, the city services, you know, the meal delivery, that became much more of what we did. Um, at the Northwest Bronx Resource Center, we also felt we wanted, we created a guide, um, which we shared to people about all the services that, that were available and the many changes that happened. Um, as an affordable housing provider, um, we halted all non-essential work. Um, we had hand sanitizers in our building. We changed our cleaning protocols. So we did everything we could to keep our staff and our tenants safe. And then, you know, we also provided information to tenants. And as a researcher, um, you know, we, we shared, um, actually we shared in three blogs during COVID that are available on our website at unhp.org, um, information about, you know, multifamily finance during the pandemic, what was happening real estate wise, um, and how that affects, you know, affects tenant rents, and investment in neighborhoods, which is, you know, all interwoven. Um, the, uh, the other blog that we did was um, really covered a lot of the work that, that um, Dr. Ige had shared with us in the beginning, um, but more with a, with a Bronx focus on how um, so many Bronx folks, you know, work in the service industry, face-to-face, -face, live in overcrowded apartments. And, you know, the connections between housing and healthcare really became, you know, very obvious, you know, so people could not quarantine in their own homes, you know, too much of a shared space. Um, and just how the, um, um, yeah, so, you know, those, those are all the things. In terms of our service side, um, as the year progressed, information and services around eviction prevention for tenants, uh, for closure prevention, for homeowners, um, people asking about the stimulus, um, people seeking affordable housing. So we did most of that remotely. Um, we were surprised, but happy that um, number one, we were able to guide people to work with programs over the phone. So we did a lot of handholding. 
you know, how to upload a photo, you know, how to get that to us, how to get it to say the Department of Finance, if you were senior and you're freezing your rent. Um, we did a lot of virtual um, Housing Connect appointments. We were able to work with volunteers virtually and Google Voice and a whole bunch of things that other people in my organization are more savvy with. But um, later on, we'll talk about, you know, tech, tech issues, you know, in the community. But overall, we, we were happy that we were able to get some people information and connected, you know, through technology. And um, yeah, and we're continuing to kind of, you know, work our way again, you know, um, affordable housing and, you know, keeping people financially stable, you know, remain big issues pre-COVID, but um, certainly more, um, you know, more prevalent now. Thank you. It's so wonderful to hear all the work that's being done. Um, in, in line with what you just said, uh, Ms. Clark, um, did clients' ability to access technology impact the way you all were able to deliver services? And if it did, how might this have changed the work that you're doing now and the way that you will do work um, going forward? Were there challenges in access, digital literacy? And what are some of the new approaches or measures that you might have already put in place or maybe considering putting in place going forward? And we, we can start with you, Ms. Park, since you segued us so nicely into that. Thank you. Um, well, it's a great question. You know, um, I think first of all, you know, we were advocates um, for really encouraging whenever possible to have a low tech solution. Um, you know, so as agencies in the city and, and programs, you know, we're all changing to, to digital, you know, think of the lowest tech piece um, because there are definitely gonna be some people that I'm not really sure we're gonna kind of bring on board. Um, thinking particularly, if, you know, we work with some seniors, they, you know, they don't have the smartphone, they don't have, you know, access to family members. Um, we, we did a lot of things by phone, which, you know, is a remote technology and uh, most people can, can work that. So, um, you know, we really began, you know, just a lot of conversations and doing, you know, talking to people um, over the phone wellness checks. We used WhatsApp, uh, which, you know, is also a technology that many immigrants use, many people use. So um, our first um, kind of forays into chats and things, we're, we're using that. But we also did a lot of uh, handholding um, with folks to, to get them um, to use technology. And, you know, I think, you know, we had a lot of success with that. Um, that said, um, you know, in terms of looking forward towards improvements, I mean, low cost internet for everyone, low cost, how about free internet for everyone? Um, the Bronx needs better broadband access, more infrastructure around um, uh, the internet, um, and then just the equipment. You know, do you have a smartphone? Do you have a laptop? Um, these are things that, you know, um, really create huge gaps in equality in terms of what people can, can do. Um, we did have, as I mentioned, a lot of success with webinars. Um, you know, we had as many as 50 people, you know, on a webinar, we were explaining, you know, something new. Um, I like to think our biggest success was um, a, a webinar for Spanish speaking seniors. Um, about the New York City rent freeze, and we had 25 participants, and we really thought that that was fabulous. Um, and we also, you know, we did a lot of hand holding to get those 25 there, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was a big accomplishment for us. Going forward, I mean, I think that many groups will be operating both in real, you know, face to face and where they can, you know, remotely. Um, you know, the, uh, the remote webinars, we've got one coming up just this Thursday, you know, the American rescue plan has a lot of benefits that are going to really be, um, important for Bronx families. Uh, there's changes to the, the current taxes that people are filing. So we, we already have like 30 people signed up, um, for an English and Spanish webinar. Um, so I think those will continue. Um, but we will always keep in mind um, seniors and, and those who are not going to be able to, to deal with that technology. I mean, I think we still need to, um, you know, have face-to-face -face services. Mm -hmm. One area we've seen, you know, this is a little tangential, but 
you know, there have been some closings of bank branches. I mean, banks, you know, are definitely embracing, you know, the online technology, the apps. Um, and yet, you know, as a group, we are really still advocating to keep branches open. Um, you know, that's a face-to-face -face service that, you know, does remain important. And it's often, you know, for immigrants, um, their first access to, you know, basically, you know, financial stability. Thank you so much. That was a very comprehensive response. If there's any of the other, other panelists who would like to add, um, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to piggyback on what Ms. Clark said just very briefly. I think uh, for us, that was like a glaring need at the beginning. Um, a lot of the community members that we were talking to either did not have access to the internet, they did not mm -hmm. have access to computers, they did not have access to smartphones. And then even the ones who did, they didn't necessarily know how to navigate. So a lot of what we did was like, well, you have to create an email. This is how you create an email address in order to apply for benefits. Uh, you know, you're gonna, you know, we were educating people about telehealth because the healthcare providers pivoted really fast to telehealth and then social uh, services providers pivoted really fast to online application portals. And so a lot of it was handholding. We also pivoted to virtual uh, workshops for um, the health education purposes. And so a lot of it has been, well, how do we work with people? How do we try to teach them or navigate them to, through the process? Um, again, as Ms. Clark said, I don't think that's something that's going away. I think we were moving in that direction anyway. I think COVID precipitated that. Um, and so definitely in the future, and I think it's brought some positive things as well. We've had a lot, a lot of participation in some workshops. We know that it's making some of our services more ac accessible to some people, but not everyone. Yeah. So yeah, I think definitely in the future, more ac internet access uh, and internet literacy seriously needs to be uh, addressed and something that we find a way to kind of I don't like to use the word educate, but that we make sure that people who have access to the internet also know how to use it to get, get access to the services that they need. Because otherwise we are leaving outside as we move forward, we're, we're, margin, we're, even, we're marginalizing even more communities who already do not have access to the services that they need. Great point, great point. Uh, Ms. Sikhan, I think you, you wanted to say something? Or? Sure, yeah, I, I, it's very interesting. Um, when Catherine talked about the low tech solution, because part of what we've been struggling with is a, a lot of our benefits assessment really it happens because it's a face-to-face -face interaction and people feel the trust and they feel comfortable and that's how we've always operated. So this has been very difficult for that since again, everything is outside, either outside. And so there really isn't a place to build that trust or we're doing it you know, electronically through a phone, through a computer. And so it, it, it has been difficult and we're trying to sort of reimagine how we can build that trusting technology in the future um, because we recognize that, that, that they're kind of competing interests. And for us, we've always felt that the face-to-face, -face, the, the ability to really meet with somebody is what makes it work um, and feeling that. Um, but, and then secondly, just another point for our nutrition education classes, um, we were be able to build a great network through technology because everything that they were doing had to go virtual. And so they started recipe clubs that were virtual. They started doing cooking demonstrations. They started you know, working and people made connections apart from the group that they may not have made if they were in a seminar setting and they continued. And, you know, they did one thing where everyone turned in their, their family recipes and we turned them into how to make them healthy. And all of this was shared digitally. And so we've had great success that we were in engagement by turning those sessions into digital, into it on a digital platform. So, you know, we've had sort of this mix depending on what programmer are and, um, you know, and so it's been interesting and we're trying to figure out how it will all happen in the future and, and what we can do. I don't think technology is the answer to everything. I really don't think in this world we can take away um, that personal interaction and what that really means. So I think we have to figure out. And I, and I think that's what, you know, people are going to be craving once COVID is over too, is to get back to that. So um, I'm hoping we're prepared in both ways to, for that world. Some great points, great points. Uh, um, Seth, do you have anything? 
Yeah, no. So I echo, I mean, the same struggles that everybody went through. Obviously, we we switched immediately. We, you know, POTS is a welcoming. We want people to come into POTS. Just send them to POTS, send them to POTS. And now we're like, no, don't come to POTS. <laughs> Let's do let's let's do everything remotely. So that was really really challenging. I mean, like everybody said, we quickly realized that many of our clients don't have access to technology. Some of them are like, oh, I don't do, use email. So what we started to do at Pods at the early, really really carefully, is we started seeing clients in our parking lot. We bought tents. We had tables. We were able to answer questions. We were able to help people apply for SNAP that didn't have a phone. Uh, we're actually now upgraded. We have two really nice booths outside of POTS where we have sometimes case managers go out there by appointments. Our legal team is answering questions. Seniors are coming like, I don't know what it is. Can you help me read this document? Um, so we're doing a lot of that. We have also started, like everybody else, doing um, online workshops. We started our first ever ESL class at POTS. I'm actually going to take them to the Botanical Garden next week as a small group since it's outside and they're doing a great exhibition. We started doing uh, computer classes, uh, heart health, stress management, tutoring for children. Uh, we've had you know, collaborations with UNHP to provide you know, services. Um, and we just continue to look for strategies to really better serve the community. I think you know, once COVID is over, there's going to be a lot of you know, mental health resources that we need to put together. We're going to have to um, you know, look at what the community needs and identify those needs and try to find strategies to, to provide access to, to services and, and to continue the work. Okay. Awesome. So, Thank you so much. I was going to... Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Ige. <laughs> yes, I was going to say that um, we, we have had at the Department of Health a, a big challenge getting connected to residents through virtual um, engagement platforms only. So we've had to do a lot of um, street canvassing and in person, like, just getting information out into the hands of people. So when we started with uh, initial grant with our CBOs, you know, it was a lot of virtual, but we, we realized that we were not able to reach the people who needed to get information. Uh, so we had to transition like me last year from like August to doing street canvassing or just trying to get flyers, information in different languages out to folks about, you know, testing and resources and all of that. So I am, I'm just curious about, you know, experiences with were you able to retain your same clientele or were you able to reach beyond the clientele that you had using virtual platforms? We, we had a big of, a bit of a challenge um, getting information to, to folks outside of um, virtual platforms. So I, I agree. Um, just want to make a quick comment on the telehealth uh, thing. Um, I, tele, I, telehealth is definitely, um, you know, barriers, the challenges that our communities are facing are definitely um, um, an emerging need. Um, and that needs to be um, taken into consideration as we, you know, introduce, you know, whatever technology, um, um, you know, and it definitely has its own advantages, uh, several advantage advantages, but, um, but you know, um, there are challenges as, you know, you guys have spoken. Um, and I, I think that as, um, you know, we uh, get into this world of technology uh, more and more uh, that we, that this should be considered, I think, that this should be, technology barriers should be considered a social determinant of health. Um, so with that, I just wanted to conclude um, because it's four minutes past the time. So thank you once again to our keynote speaker, Dr. Ige, and to all our wonderful panelists uh, today, Josef um, Aguilar from POTS, Catherine Clark from UNHB, Judy Sekon from New York Common Pantry, and Patricia Bernard from BCHN for what an amazing and insightful and thought-provoking discussion. Uh, a huge thanks to Renee Whiskey for moderating today's session. Social determinants of health will continue to threaten the lives of our disadvantaged communities, but we all, when I say we, all of us are committed um, to continue to bring more attention to this important role they play in healthcare inequities and the need to invest in addressing these social needs to address health inequities. 
Our next two sessions will continue the discussion on the same theme, addressing basic social needs in the time of COVID and beyond, but each with a different focus. On April 13th from 2 to 3 p.m., our discussion will focus on sustaining the value of community health workers. Then on April 27th, same time, 2 to 3 p.m., the discussion will focus on going digital. To learn more about BCHN, its upcoming episodes of Learning Cafe at BCHN, and our other upcoming events, please visit our website at www.bchnhealth.org. If you need to reach us, you can email us at info at bchnhealth.org. Thank you all again for your participation and have a good rest of the evening.